Hi, this is Manos Berlakis and this is video 26.5 for the Manual of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions. This is a video presenting a step-by-step -step description of how to do pericardiosynthesis. In the setting of PCI, pericardiosynthesis is usually needed when the patient develops tamponade, which in turn is caused by coronary perforation. There are different types of perforation discussed in separate videos. These are the 18 steps of pericardiosynthesis. These apply both to pericardial effusion caused by coronary perforation, but also to drainage of non-perforation-related pericardial effusions. Starting with the first step, which is to support the patient. That's especially important in patients who have perforation and tamponade. These are the four universal steps in the management of coronary perforation. The first one is to inflate a balloon to occlude the vessel. The second is to provide fluids and vasopressors if needed. Do pericardiosynthesis if the patient develops hypotension and call the surgeon in case emergency surgery is needed. The second one is to perform an echocardiogram and this is done of course if the time is available. If a patient into, goes into tamponade and there is no time for an echo machine to come in the room, then the pericardiosynthesis may have to be performed without echocardiographic guidance. But whenever possible, it is much safer and better to get echocardiography to visualize uh, the pericardiosynthesis and the result. Step number three is to select the approach. There are three potential approaches. The first one is zapxiphoid, which is the most common one for perforations. The second one is the apical, which is also commonly used. And the third one is the parasternal. I personally have not done or seen a parasternal pericardiosynthesis in 20 years in the cath lab. So I think this is uh, much less commonly done, but this is one of the potential options. Each of those approaches has plus and minuses. The zapxiphoid is the most commonly used. The downside is that sometimes you may have to traverse a significant distance inside the tissue, especially in bigger patients, before reaching the pericardial space. In contrast, the apical, the apical approach might be closer to the heart, but there is a risk of uh, lacerating the intercostal arteries. The fourth step is to prepare the equipment. There are some uh, pre-made pericardiosynthesis kits that uh, make this easier, but if they're not available, one can perform pericardiosynthesis by using any standard needle, a standard O35 wire, as well as a standard sheath. I personally like to insert a sheath in the pericardium first, and then a pigtail can be an, uh, in a pigtail can be inserted into the pericardial space. The next step is to prepare the skin. So we prepare with uh, chlorhexidine or other antiseptic, and then uh, use a drape that uh, allows uh, access to the point of access to the pericardium. The sixth step is to give a local anesthetic. This is an example of zapsiphoid pericardiosynthesis. Uh, typically, we want to hit uh, the bottom of the sternum, give some lidocaine, and then turn under and go under the sternum. The next step is to go and advance the needle into the pericardium. This is an example of going into the sub uh, approach. We're advancing, pointing the needle towards the left shoulder, and then at some point we start seeing fluid come back. When we start doing this approach, it is important to first uh, hit the bottom of the sternum. Once we do that and go under the sternum, then we turn the needle flatter and aim for the left shoulder. Once we see the fluid come back, which can be serous or serosanguinous, as in this case, or can be blood in other cases, then we we'll leave the needle in for the next step, which is to inject bubbles under echocardiographic guidance to see if we indeed have entered into the pericardial space. Here is an example of fluoroscopy with a, with a zapsiphoid approach. Again, we're aiming towards the left shoulder. These are the structures that can potentially be affected by pericardiosynthesis attempts. One can hit the internal mammary artery, and that is why the parasternal is an approach I personally am less in favor of. But even zapsiphoid or apical can cause injury, for example, of coronary arteries, can go injury by going into the pericardium. They can injure the lungs and cause a pneumothorax. 
uh, for the zapsiphoid, they can be peritoneal puncture or liver and stomach puncture. So there are many potential risks by advancing a needle and understanding the anatomy can help minimize those risks. When the apical approach is needed, it is important to advance the needle just above the upper border of the rib because the subcostal vessels, the intercostal vessels, actually course usually on the inferior border of the rib. So by going on the superior border of the rib, we're less likely to hit those arteries. These are some examples that are more complicated. Again, we, here we're trying to do a zapsiphoid. We are trying to advance towards the left shoulder. We make the needle flatter and we keep on advancing. And then we have a constant suction going in. At some point, there is some blood going in. So this is hard to know whether we went into the cavity or whether we went into the pericardial space. That's where the bubbles are very useful. That was a micropuncture needle. This is an 018 um, a needle, an 18-gauge needle. And um, here, have the same situation. We're advancing. There's some serosanguinous fluid back, coming back, but it's not clear whether we're in the pericardial space or not. And here, once again, um, the administration of bubbles can be very useful. This is blood coming back. It's another example when we're pulling back, pulling back blood. This could be in the pericardial space, especially when we have perforation, but it's hard to know. So the next step is to inject the bubbles and then see under echocardiography whether we're in the space or not. And this is one of the potential bad things that can happen. One can go through the heart. This is an example of a pigtail placed through the right ventricle during um, attempts to drain a pericardial effusion. This required surgery, removal of the catheter, and then uh, suturing and administration of some fibrin glue. Sometimes, especially if there is no time to get echo, one can use the contrast that goes in the pericardium as a marker of the pericardial space and advance a needle into the space. Step number eight is to inject the bubbles. As we discussed before, injecting the bubbles can be very useful because looking at the echo, we can see where the bubbles are going. This is what we'd like to see. This is the pericardial space before the bubble administration, and this is with bubbles. We can see very clearly that our needle is inside the pericardial space. And this is another example. We can see that the bubbles are clearly inside the pericardial space. Another example, pericardial space, bubbles clearly in the pericardial space. Um, we can also uh, sometimes see the IVC being dilated in cases of um, uh, tamponade. This is a different example, though, where we see the bubbles are actually into the right ventricle. So this is clearly not the right spot. Our needle is into the cavity, and we should not insert a guide wire and a pigtail into the right ventricular cavity. Once we confirm that we're in the pericardium, the next step is to advance a guide wire into the pericardium. And typically, we check the position by fluoroscopy. This is how it should look. It should wrap around the heart. If we see the wires start going into structures following the potential course of blood vessels like the pulmonary artery, that should be a source of concerns and we want to confirm that we're in the right spot. Another example where the wire seems to be wrapping around the heart. Step number 10 is to insert a sheath. This is optional, but I personally use it in most of my cases. The reason is, especially for elective pericardiosynthesis, that you can use the side arm of the sheath to transduce the pressure into the pericardium, and then we have a real-time assessment of the pericardial pressure. The next step is to insert the pigtail catheter over the O35 guide wire into the pericardial space. Next step is to measure the pericardial pressure. Again, that's more relevant for chronic pericardial effusions. This is an example of such a measurement showing very high pressures in the 25 to 30 millimeter mercury range. And uh, the next step is to drain the effusion. We typically, for uh, perforations, get the blood and give it back to a peripheral IV. But for um, other pericardial effusions, usually we send a couple big syringes, 50 cc, for analysis in the lab. And then the remaining of fluid, we advance it into a bag that comes with a pericardial synthesis tray. Again, for chronic effusions or acute effusions, we send the fluid for analysis. Typically, we do analysis for gram stain and cultures, cytology, analysis for mycobacteria, and occasionally PCR for viruses. 
After we drain the fluid, then we repeat uh, the echocardiogram to make sure that the effusion is drained. This is before and after, showing nice drainage of the effusion. This is another example, before and after, showing that the effusion has been essentially completely drained. And then we do measure the final pericardial pressure after we confirm with echo that the fluid has been uh, completely drained. There's before and after, we can see remarkable decrease in the intrapericardial pressure. And typically, we'll also see that the, press, the patient's systemic pressure will significantly increase. Also, we often see that the inferior vena cava that is often dilated and uh, does not collapse with inspiration at the, at the stage of tamponade, then decreases in size and now collapses with inspiration after the pericardial fluid is drained. So this is an example of um, a patient who had pericardial effusion drained. We can see the double density here where there's a large amount of pericardial effusion. After draining, the cavity has expanded. We don't no longer have this double density. We can see the impeller device is actually now closer to the apex. Step number 17 is we suture the sheath and the drain to make sure it does not come out. And then number 18 is to do a chest x-ray to make sure we do not have uh, a pneumothorax, which is one of the potential complications. So to summarize, there are 18 steps for performing pericardiocentesis, having a systematic step-by-step -step approach and meticulously executing for each step can optimize the safety as well as the success of pericardiocentesis. Thank you.